okay. Now, there's never really, I haven't worked out anyway, a professional, really cool, sexy way of starting these interviews. Um, and I almost feel embarrassed because this will be a really cool chat and um, and I'm already rambling. So, <laughs> hello, Jack. How are you going, mate? Hi, Matt. I'm good. And uh, <laughs> thanks for me through to have a chat to you today. Oh, mate, the pleasure's all mine, that's for sure. Um, Jack, we've known each other for a long, long time, and I could introduce you in a million different ways, but I'd like you to introduce yourself to all our thousands. I think we're up to uh, a million viewers now, so that's really good. Um, oh. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself, Jack. Who are you? What's your background, mate? Okay, so um, well, I'm a Sunshine Coast boy. As you know, that's how we know each other. Um, growing up in that environment as, uh, as kids and through into young adulthood. Um, I, I guess with regards to our conversation today, the, the, um, the most important thing is what I've done as an adult. And uh, I guess uh, most recently I've been a microbiologist. I trained myself at university doing an undergraduate degree, um, graduating with honours and progressing to a PhD in that field. And uh, now after about uh, 13 years, um, working in various capacities in that sort of environment, I've uh, just recently, the last couple of years, made a change to study medicine and take a, take a new career path. So um, that's kind of me in a nutshell, at least from a, um, from a career perspective. Yeah. Sure. Now, where I am today is uh, at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Jack, have you ever been to the University of the Sunshine Coast? Uh, <laughs> I, was the, uh, I was the second year of science to go through that university. So wow. um, I was uh, part of it from its very early days. And um, it's also where I did my PhD and it's where I did the majority of my, uh, my research and teaching and, and other uh, university-oriented um, work activities so yeah I spent many years at that university <laughs> and many nights too yes definitely yeah some late nights there exactly uh, I remember one time we caught up for lunch at uni and uh, and you had a blister or something on your thumb because as part of your PhD you were doing so many tests with the um, I don't know what sort of machine it was but yeah 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 that was uh, all the pipetting so um, just drawing up liquid from one tube, putting it into another tube. That's the, the crux of uh, modern day microbiology. Do that a couple of million times and they give you a PhD. <laughs> Can you claim work as compensation for that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I believe you. <laughs> just put in a claim. Uh, mate, let's, let's talk about microbiology. Now, I'm sure you, you, don't, you don't hear that too many times at dinner conversations, but uh, tell us why you went down that road. Well, um, I think it, it stems all the way from childhood for me, really. I've uh, always had a really uh, deep interest in the natural world, even from a young age, um, just a curiosity about how uh, the world, the life, and, and I guess the whole universe from that sort of perspective works. And, uh, and my parents helped foster that. They, um, they used to sit us down in front of nature documentaries like David Attenborough and and things like that as we were growing up, my brothers and I. And, uh, and so that just further developed that interest. And, um, and then, of course, going through school, especially high school, I, uh, just because of my interest, I think uh, I found it very easy to study biology and I did very well at it. And so I thought the natural progression after, after exiting high school was to uh, pursue what I was, uh, appeared to be good at. And, um, and enrolled in a, uh, a science degree at the university. So, so that got me into uh, university. And um, Well, let me stop you there quickly and ask this, I can ask you this question. So you, you, you've enrolled at uni in a, uh, in a Bachelor of Science. Is that what it was at that point? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So back in those days, uh, it was just a little bit different to how it is today. You right. enroll in kind of a generic science program and, um, and then you didn't choose your majors until you were uh, you had completed your first year. So I didn't have to make that sort of decision until I'd finished my first year of university and then and had to choose uh, what majors we were going down. Um, okay, cool. And it's not like, yeah, go on, go on. 
but it's not like something just had always drawn me towards microbiology. I was, I was pretty pragmatic about my decision to, uh, to get into microbiology and in that we had a small cohort, of course, at a new university. There weren't very many of us at all. Um, uh, but talking to... Back to like 90... Five? 98. 98. 98. 98. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, not, not too many of us, but talking to some of my other uh, friends and, um, and uh, colleagues, most of them were choosing environmental science or sports science as their uh, uh, avenues of, um, of uh, progression. And I thought, well, if just about everyone here is choosing those... <laughs> There's not that many jobs in science, so You've there's going to be a lot of competition. Other way, right? Yeah, so it's actually <laughs> like, well, maybe I should try something that fewer people are doing and wow. increase my chances of uh, getting a job out of this, because really that was the reason why I went to university. And, um, and so that worked out quite well for me in the end, and I found microbiology uh, extremely interesting and, uh, and did quite well at it. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, so, and that's a really good business lesson too as a side point. You know, if everyone's doing something... Uh, that might be great, but there's a lot more benefit in swimming the other way. So, uh, so well done. Um, but so, so at that point, and you've got into this uh, specialty subjects of microbiology. Where was your head at in regards to the future career? What were you thinking you were going to do at that point? Well, I was a bit naive to really where I was heading. Um, you know, I don't come from a family that have a. Uh, my parents aren't university educated. Um, they don't work in a professional environment. And so their ability to kind of guide me in that respect was, was limited. They were just happy that I was pursuing something that I seemed to enjoy. Um, and so the, the progression and, and what science was going to offer me was a big unknown. I was really just taking it as it came. Even the idea of doing something like an honours degree hadn't even occurred to me until I was getting close to the end of my third year to the end of my degree. And one of my lecturers asked me if I had considered, uh, considered doing honours. And, um, and then I said, well, what is that? <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of uh, my education through university was very much like that. It was just um, taking advantage of opportunities that presented themselves rather than having any clear plan of attack and clear goal of where I wanted to be. Uh, because I was, I was coming at it just fresh and new and didn't really have many expectations. Yeah. Got it. Would you say, <clears throat> I'm, I'm assuming if, if your professor or your lecturer is coming to you saying, have you thought about honours, your mark mm. must have been pretty good, yeah? They were reasonable. You know, um, I think it's important here that, yeah, I've, I've reached a pretty high level of, uh, of education with a PhD and going on to med and everything. But you know, back in my undergrad, I wasn't a um, top student. I wasn't a you know, um, chancellor, Chancellor's Award medalist or anything crazy like that. I had a, a just a slightly above average GPA of 5.5 and that's what I needed to get into an honours program. So that was fine. I think the thing that, that allowed me to stand out a little bit more than having exceptional grades uh, was simply that I was just interested and I was um, keen and, uh, and I was willing to put the effort in. And, and I think that counts for as much if not sometimes more than uh than things like gpa which most people are, are assessed on these days exactly yeah because you know having that passion um you can't teach that can you like a gpa you can improve on you can improve that but being passionate and giving a shit about something um yeah that's that's the biggest thing that's good i'm glad you said that yeah it is and i think the other thing i'll just add in there is uh um i think a lot of who are just focused on nothing but their GPA, uh, they miss out on three years of, of youth, of fun, of being a young adult and going out and socialising and pursuing other interests. And uh, they can be so focused on just that one thing. And I think I managed to have a good balance, actually, in those early years. There was a, there was a lot of partying. There was a lot of good fun. There was um, uh, a lot of friends made during those years. And so um, I certainly wouldn't... Um, sacrifice those experiences for a slightly better GPA. You know what yeah. I mean? Sorry, Jack. I'm not sure what you mean when you say partying and all that. I've never, uh, never done that, mate. So. Oh, yes. No, such an angel. <laughs> all right, cool. So uh, my, my next question is around, uh, you know, you and I are the same age. We went to the same primary school together. We had sleepovers at each other's house. 
it was really weird then, fast forward 15, 20 years, for you, me being the student and you being the, the shooter uh, in mm. certain science classes when I was doing science here. Um, my question is, did you enjoy that? Did you enjoy the tutoring side of it, the presenting side of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, you know, looking back uh -huh. at my youth in academia, it's the teaching that I enjoyed the most, actually. Um, uh, research itself, working in a laboratory, can be a little bit isolating sometimes. You're just working in your own space, doing your own thing, thinking about your own things. But when you're teaching, you're interacting with others. And, uh, and more than that, I really enjoyed trying to, um, to impart the things that I've learned onto my students. And, uh, and I remember the difficulties that I had grasping some of the concepts that, that need to learn you know, a science degree. And, um, and I really enjoyed uh, coming up with ways to make that process a little bit easier for students, to give them some hints on how to study effectively, to give them uh, some hints on how to just, just grapple with concepts in a uh, logical way that doesn't make them too frightening, especially some of the more difficult ones when you first come across them. And, uh, and, and for me, one of the most satisfying things was um, helping students who were struggling with some of the concepts uh, through to a point where you just see the light bulb come on, yeah. they realised how it worked or whatever the concept was, and um, and you could see that understanding, and uh, and uh, and that was very satisfying for me to uh, to reach that goal with a student. Yeah. With um, at, at the end of each term, the students have to submit some sort of feedback form as to what they thought of the course and the tutor and stuff like that. What sort of feedback did you get, Jack? Was it was it positive? Yeah, I, I had very good feedback with my um, my years in teaching. The formative uh, submissions that they had to provide, the feedback to the university it was usually ranked out of five, and I um, consistently had uh, anywhere from four to five for some subjects. So I think I gave six. <laughs> 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 a little biased, <laughs> but <laughs> you might have skewed that one, Matt. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I think um, I had good feedback from students and, and I think, uh, uh, more importantly, I had good feedback from my other academic colleagues about the way that I approached my teaching and handled classrooms and lectures. And, uh, and, uh, and that's, that was, um, you know, uh, I think when a colleague uh, who's looking at it from that perspective is able to give you that, that positive feedback on how you're doing at your job, uh, that's... Um, that's a real indication that you're doing something right then. But um, another, another interesting story I have actually, I was, I was out one night, this is uh, quite a while ago, but um, I met one of my former students just out on the town one night and, um, and they came up to me and they said, you know, they had finished university at this stage and they said, the only thing that I remember out of my entire degree is the subject you taught me. And so, <laughs> and so I thought, well, I'm, I must have definitely done something all right if, uh, yeah. if that was the case, so, yeah. Or it was so bad that that's all that you were it could, it could have been so traumatising that they'll never, <laughs> never unlive it. Uh, I'm sure it's the former, mate. Are you sure this person wasn't drunk or trying to pick you up? Uh, well, it was a male, so I hope oh. they weren't trying to pick me up, uh, exactly. just from my perspective. And, um, uh, and they were definitely drunk, though. So. Yeah. And, uh, I'm sure it was all, uh, all, all good. Nice work. Yeah. All right, so cool. Let's... let's um, Fast forward to the present then, or even starting two years ago, right, when you started your med degree. Now, you spent 13 years, as you said, in microbiology land, mm. and that's definitely going down a certain path. And now, two years ago, you've, you've sort of transitioned completely different path, or maybe not completely different, but a different path all the same, into medicine and becoming a doctor, and, you know, mm. a a doctor of medicine. Um, why? It's a simple, <laughs> a simple question, but it's actually quite a quite a difficult answer, fairly convoluted, because um, for for quite a number of reasons, uh, which is what makes it uh, complicated. But uh, I think, firstly, it's important for me to just uh, outline that I wasn't only in microbiology for those uh, thirteen years in the academic environment. I spent a long time on my PhD and, um, and it was a problematic PhD. There were lots of technical issues with the equipment I was using and 
he had contamination problems, which set me back by huge amounts of time and lots of funding um, had to be spent to get things back on track. So um, without going into too many details, I almost ended up doing two PhDs in order to, to get wow. things to a point where, uh, where they could, you know, be reasonably submitted as a PhD. And, uh, and that's not without exaggeration either. Um, and so that, that just prolonged the PhD process considerably. And uh, during the last years of the PhD, I was working full time uh, to try to, uh, you know, get myself through. I was no longer under a um, PhD scholarship as my source of income. You're working, uh, and at that, the uni? working at the university, I spent a little bit of time. I spent six months doing some research down at Wollongong University and uh, uh, finished up there and came back to the coast again. And uh, then I thought maybe um, I'll try something outside of science. A opportunity came up to do some uh, grant management, sort of contract management for the university. And so I started developing some more uh, office-based administrative and managerial type skills. Um, got to see the back workings of the university through that sort of job. And from there, I was headhunted by another um, another group within the university, which were involved in project management for a, for a very large project. And um, so I hopped over there and uh, helped lead that. And so that gave me some uh, more experience in project management. Unfortunately, once the funding for that project ran out, the, um, the group was pretty much disbanded. And uh, so then I hopped over and worked with the head of school for science as a um, kind of as a jack of all trades, really. Um, I was a writer for him. I helped them win um, awards for teaching that was being done within the faculty um, and also other areas of the university. Helped them win grants for extra uh, facilities at the university and um, and provided, I guess, general advice. So it was just uh, this wasn't a, a clear, there wasn't a clear job description for that. They just needed someone who could jump in and fill holes and gaps that were required. And so that gave me a lot of uh, very varied experience. And, um, and the fact that the head of school uh, trusted me with doing those sorts of things was um, quite a compliment for me. You were, you were the jack of all trades, pardon the pun. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that's the thing that um, even in my academic time when I was teaching, I wasn't just teaching microbiology. I taught across 11 different subject areas, some of which I'd never studied before. You know, you just uh, learn it quickly and, wow. and then pass on to learn. And uh, that's, uh, that's part of it. So I, I became very adaptable. And I think that's the thing that um, the 13 years of jumping from one thing to another, to another, to another, uh, really made me adaptable and, and developed a lot of different skills. So uh, even though it was uh, awkward at some times, there was a lot of unemployment in between teaching contracts while uh, in between semesters at universities, for instance, when you're a casual tutor, you're unemployed for you know, quite a number of months every year. In between contracts, uh, you're unemployed. So there's a lot of unemployment or underemployment during those 13 years. Well, let me touch um, on that then. Let me touch on that because that's where I'm at at the moment, right? And I've had four months now of, of that unemployment. And I'd love to know where your head goes during that time. Here you are, a very, very obviously intelligent person. Uh, and you have a, um, you know, a, a, an impressive job when you're working. But in those holiday times and between contracts, how do you deal with the unemployment? Yeah, I, I always found it a little bit frustrating. You know, I was working very hard and trying to do very good work and I had good feedback that I was doing good work. So the fact that, that I was finding it difficult to secure ongoing employment um, was always a frustration for me. Um, I guess it's not that it got me down or anything. I usually knew especially while doing casual teaching, you always knew that at the end of semester, you wouldn't have a job until the next semester started up. And then you'd be scrambling to pick up subjects to get enough work to get through that semester. And so I was always planning ahead. I was always saving for unemployment. And, and I guess that was another frustration though, because rather than saving money to get ahead in life, to, to invest or to travel or do things, I was constantly saving just to support myself through unemployment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so anything I saved would basically go out the window while I was yeah, living exactly. in those, those months <laughs> and I'd start from scratch again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. in the end, in the end, 
uh, just to give you an idea of how I got through to med and, and how these sorts of things contributed to that decision. Um, my last contract with the university was as a full lecturer. I was um, coordinating and lecturing across second and third year molecular biology. And I was also coordinating and lecturing, I say, uh, enabling nursing physiology. And, um, and so that was a pretty big workload. So those three full subjects of which I was pretty much rewriting those as well. It wasn't like I was just teaching what was already there. Um, whilst also there's still expectations that you've got a research output and the universities these days have expectations that there's things like community engagement and other um, external activities that you're involved in. So to, to pull that off, you're, on paper it says 40 hours a week, but in, um, in real terms it's 60 hours plus, which I don't mind. I, I quite enjoy hard work. But um, when you're required to have a PhD to get to that level, um, I had 13 years of experience in that field under my belt, and, uh, and yet I'm offered a two-year contract simply because I'm filling in for someone else who's gone away for a while. Wow. Uh, you're, you're left kind of going, well, I am the same amount as my two brothers who are high school teachers yeah, and, right. um, and against high school teachers. But uh, the level of education required to become a high school teacher is considerably less than a lecturer. Done, yeah. And yeah, yeah. And so you're not really being remunerated, I think, um, uh, according to the, the skill level that, all the time. Is that, that, yeah, is, can, can I ask this, is that PhDs in general or the microbiology industry that you chose to go down? That's academia in general. So those sorts of positions, unless there's some specific arrangement, uh, perhaps for a particular um, individual, then there, there's kind of blanket uh, rates at which uh, different levels of employment get paid. And, uh, and of course, as your experience goes up, that does become better. But, um, but you know, uh, it, it was just something which I, would, I didn't do microbiology or get into science for the for the money. So I just put that out there. And I just certainly didn't mind earning the salary that I was earning. I could have quite happily stayed on that and, and lived a very comfortable life. Mm. But, um, but the, the crux of my decision came when I thought, well, I've got this two-year contract, but then what happens after that? And uh, so I made an appointment to talk to the Dean of Science, and just ask him about whether or not he saw potential for me to continue on in some capacity at the end of that contract. And, uh, and he, he sat down with me and we had a good talk. And, um, and he was very honest. And I think I'm, I'm very thankful that he was honest with me. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't um, paint the situation with, um, uh, uh, you know. Rainbows and butterflies or anything like that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But he was very complimentary, though, at the same time. So almost in his exact words, because I remember quite clearly, he said to me, he said, Jack, I've, I've heard a lot of, about you, because we hadn't officially met, really, uh, at this stage. And he said, everything that I've heard about you, if I repeated to you, would make you blush and so that's quite a compliment coming from the dean of science and um and he said but when it comes to employment at the university we have to advertise and the criteria that we're looking at is the number of research publications that our candidates have and i've got some publications but certainly not not a great many compared to what's out there yeah. that's right and it would be very easy if that's the primary criteria for for someone else to pit me post and uh and i thought well here's someone who's just told me that i do excellent work for the university i'm already operating the capacity that the future employment that i'm looking for would be requiring of me and i'm i'm proving that i'm doing a very good job of that and yet despite the fact that my boss essentially has a capable educated hard-working employee who's proven himself all that we need is some yeah, with, uh, with just a few extra publications. And, uh, and so I thought, well, once again, I'm in a situation of insecurity. I don't know, even if I work hard at getting more publications, I don't know if I'm gonna have a job at the end of this. And I realized that I'd spent, you know, the last 10 plus years just living in that frame of mind. I don't know if I'm gonna have a job at the end of this. And that was the case all the time. And, and so I thought, you, you know, how did you feel about that at that point? Like, did you dwell on that for a long time, knowing that all this work that I've done hasn't given me any necessary security? 
Um, I, I think all scientists, because uh, of course I, I work mostly with the scientists of the university, all, it dwells on all scientists' minds these days um, because it's not just uh, unique to me. Um, most of my friends who have PhDs are struggling with the same issues of uh, short-term contracts as the nature of their uh, employment. Um, often those contracts are reliant on successfully get uh, research funding, which is highly competitive. Um, I have one friend who his wife is a PhD as well as him. They've got a young family and he missed out on his last round of funding and the university said, thanks, bye. Wow. And so he's out and employed. Um, his wife, uh, I'm not sure, she's only part-time employed. He's trying to raise a family and they're relying on him and he's under a lot of pressure. And so he's opened up a restaurant. Um, you know, to fill that gap. And I've got another friend who has a PhD who works at a roadhouse. Another friend who has a PhD who works as a checkout chicken. I met a guy at a social event. He had a PhD in communication. He worked at Dan Murphy's. And, um, you know, there's a lot of highly educated people, not just in science, but across the many different areas. Who um, uh, uh, There's not a lot for you after you've got a PhD. There's, there's just not the jobs for it. And yet there's an awful lot of PhD graduates out there now. Uh, far more than there are jobs. There's, um, mate, that's, 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 that's amazing, right? How can you go and do a PhD and then be working at a, you know, at a register or at a bottle or something like that? Um, and definitely mm. something I'd love to chat about more. Maybe we can get together another time and, and, and discuss that. Um, but with, with our limited time, and we've got about 10 minutes to, to continue our chat, I'd love to, sure. to, to chat about... Um, you got you got into medicine, and I'm going to assume that it wasn't just because of the security, because you could have gone down lots of different roads, right? So why did you choose that specifically? So um, medicine, I thought, was one of the the only options that would still draw on the things that I had already learned. So um, even though I'd worked in microbiology, taught in physiology, and and things like that, uh, I certainly wasn't at the level that, uh, that, that medicine trains you at. I realized I had the platform to get started on that, on that next career path. And really after doing a PhD in that sort of field, the only thing which would act as a progression from that is, is medicine. And, uh, and I thought also, uh, I figured I would get a lot of reward out of it. And I reflected on what I enjoyed about the work that I had done. And the thing that I enjoyed the most was the teaching and helping students reach you know, a, a higher level of understanding of what it is that they were pursuing. And I figured medicine would give me a similar level of satisfaction, helping people with, uh, with their health and, and perhaps in some cases their life choices and, and uh, getting people back on track in, in those avenues I knew would provide me with um, uh, quite considerable self-satisfaction. Uh, so that those things all weighed in. To, to that decision. and in the end it was a very easy decision as I mentioned before I had that meeting with the dean before I had left his office I decided I was going to sit the game sat and, and head down that path wow so, yeah. and, and what was the first step so you've come out of that meeting going all right well there's no security here um, I'm going to go down the, the medicine road what what was the first step um, so from that point, I just started uh, investigating what I needed to do to get into medical school. And uh, I realised I had to sit the, uh, the GAMSAT uh, exam to um, get entry. And uh, um, I just did a little bit of preparation to make sure I had uh, the knowledge required to get through that exam. I actually didn't do a whole lot because I fit well, if I've got a two-year contract, I should finish those two years and save up a bit of money. So, I thought I'd sit the game set once, have a go at it, see how difficult it really was. And what is and, that, mate? Tell me what that is. Uh, it's just a medical entry exam. So it's a big, big exam. It takes uh, pretty much all day. Uh, wow. and, uh, and it tests you on, well, the sciences, obviously, across uh, biology, chemistry, uh, some physics. Yeah. And uh, also tests your uh, written communication capabilities. And then it's kind of like a... Uh, humanities sort of section where your ability to interpret um, prose, um, poetry, cartoons, different different types wow. of media um, and your ability to draw, to draw information out of that is also tested. So, yeah. It's a, so, okay, so if, um, 
someone's coming right out of school, I'm going to assume you need a decent OP or whatever it is in equivalent states before you can even do that test. Um, how did you, with your PhD, did you still have to prove anything or could you just go ahead and do that test? Yeah, no, anyone, anyone can sit the exam. Uh, I think if you're straight out of high school, it's a different process. I'm not sure if high school students need to sit the exam sat, but they need a very high OP generally to get into uh, uh, medical school and they'll do pre-med then, which will guarantee them entry into postgraduate uh, medicine okay. uh, for the rest of us. So I could go uh, and do that test? Yeah, you could. Yep, you've already got a degree, so you're eligible to begin medical school. Uh, you would just have to sit that exam and, uh, and then meet the GPA cutoffs for different universities. And every university has a slightly different yeah, entry okay. requirement. Not just that exam, there could be an interview, there could be some documents you need to submit, a portfolio or you know, a combination of things depending on the university. Yeah, got it. And I'll just correct you there, mate. I haven't actually got a, a degree. I didn't finish the, uh, the exercise science. I think after uh, you left, I lost interest and uh, <laughs> didn't keep going. No. Now I opened a gym and thought, oh, this is this is how I'll make my millions and um, got out of uni. But anyway, that's a story for another time. Um, all right, so, but again, that's, that's a conversation I'd love to continue knowing more about what that process was and, and what it's like now. And, um, but, but, but maybe tell us what's something you're enjoying the most at the moment. You're two years into a seven-year medical degree. Oh into a four-year medical degree. So in medicine seven years, if you, are, if you begin it straight out of high school, you haven't done another degree. So you need to do your, your initial kind of undergraduate and then, then you go into postgraduate medicine, which is where the medical training actually is. So can, anyone, can you do any old, could I do, no disrespect to Bachelor of Arts, but could I just do a Bachelor of Arts and then still only have the four years? Yep, that's right. So in, in our cohort right now, we've got people with, uh, we've got lawyers, we've got people with advertising backgrounds and uh, there'll be people with arts backgrounds. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, medicine is quite varied, uh, but at the same time, those students would have still had to prove themselves uh, either through a gap or, or yeah, yeah, and other avenues to get in. So they've still had to do their work to get into medicine. Yeah. Got it, got it. Okay, so, so what's, the, what's the thing you're enjoying the most? Um, there's a number of things really. I enjoy the challenge. I find myself really being challenged on a daily basis once again. And um, I haven't had that for a while just because, you know, I'm kind of eased into some of the roles that I've had over the years and uh, kind of transitioned through them fairly, fairly smoothly. But, um, but now I'm really being pushed and I enjoy being pushed. Um, it, it kind of just takes me to that, that next level rather than cruising. And um, so I, I enjoy that. It's got its frustrations as well, though. You know, the, the amount uh, medicine isn't necessarily all that all that difficult conceptually. It's really just the volume of information that you have to oh, take. In. And yeah, yeah. The, uh, the the typical analogy that people use in med is it's like drinking from a fire hose, and it's it's very true. <laughs> you hear it before you go into med. And you think, oh, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Then, then you hit your first couple of weeks and you realise it's maybe an under um, wow. <laughs> representation of how full on yeah. it actually is. So, um, so yeah, yeah, it's just a volume overload. But, uh, but again, you know, you just adapt to that. And, uh, and, and I enjoy it, actually. And the, the other thing that I've really enjoyed about going back to study is uh, just meeting a lot of new people, a lot of young people. Um, a lot of people in med are pretty impressive. Uh, individuals yeah. that have done a lot of hard work, yeah, to get where they are, and uh, and they're very focused people, and, and I really enjoy um, being surrounded by people with that sort of mentality. So yeah, I, I find it um, inspiring. That's so cool, mate. And can I just say it's really impressive too. You know, you should be proud of yourself what you've done. And uh, I'm a big believer in patience and consistency, and doing small things over a long period of time is what gets your results, right? And um, you know, you've definitely shown a massive level of patience with your with your journey. And here we are in our late thirties, nearly forties, and you're going down a whole new road and a whole new avenue and becoming a doctor. And I think a lot of people that might be watching this going, "Well, I'm in my thirties or my forties or even my fifties, and if Jack can do it, try this whole new world, then why can't I?" Sort of thing. So. 
Mm. That's really awesome, mate. Well done. Um, Thanks. Cool, cool. All right, Dak. So, uh, mate, I had to pause the interview. As, uh, as as awesome as it's been so far, I've been missing coffee. So, got the coffee and uh, ready to go. Yes. Yep. Cool, mate. Cool. So, my next question for you is, and we're getting a bit uh, deep here, but uh, they're the best conversations to have. I don't like small talk. I like big talk. And this is uh, yes. definitely a good example of that. So, mate, tell us a little bit about your life philosophy. Okay, so um, that, that is a difficult question, I think. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I really would say I hold to any one particular philosophy. And, uh, and when thinking about it, I would say that I uh, approach life maybe from more of what I would call a values perspective rather than a philosophical one. And, um, and uh, even though I love thinking about things from a philosophical perspective, coming from a science background, it, I think understanding the world from that um, scientific perspective uh, automatically makes a person philosophical, actually, if they're, if they're approaching it correctly. Yeah, and, um, but, uh, but for myself, yeah, I guess those values that I just mentioned, I think are the values that, um, that my parents really instilled into me and uh, give them all the credit for, for how I uh, really think I approach life. And that is that I think the important things for an individual or for myself are to work hard and treat people honestly, kindly and equally. And I think those are the things that have influenced my actions as an adult uh, the most. And, uh, and I think um, from that, you know, the qualities that I really you know, detest in other people, not that I detest other people, but uh, I detest arrogance and, and blatant dishonesty for the purpose of, uh, of manipulating others. Those things really, really gall me. And... Um, and, uh, and I think it's just because, you know, I, I just uh, try to treat people the way that I would like to be treated myself and I uh, try to do that um, well as much as I can. So you wouldn't say I'm perfect at it, but yeah. Exactly. And, and who is, right? Um, I, I really like that, you know, and a lot of the times those sort of words, honesty, hard work, uh, treating people equally, they're almost cliches. They come out of lots of people's mouths. But what I get about you is that you do live and breathe those qualities. Um, what, what I've noticed a lot in these four months of applying for lots and lots of jobs and going to lots and lots of interviews and then getting responses from these high up, sometimes CEOs of companies is uh, there's no honesty there. And, mm. you know, they might say, we'll call you Tuesday and they don't. And, uh, you know, we'd love to give you the job, but we're not going to because of X, Y, and Z. And I know full well that X, Y, and Z is not the reason why they're not giving me the job. You know, there's, there's a, real lack of, um, a real lack of honesty. And, and this is from people that are the heads of companies and organisations. And I think, and I'm, I'd love you to chime in on this, but I think uh, people will uh, lie to others to avoid that confrontation. And that's why I was really glad to hear about your Dean of Science that said, Jack, you're awesome. We would love to have you, but at the end of the day, that's not going to happen, you know. Mm. And you have more respect for that guy, right, even though he didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. That's right. And he, he could have uh, led me down the garden path and, uh, and, uh, and I could have ended up being in a situation where I wasn't prepared to make decisions that I have made simply because, you know, it was, um, I was pounced on by, uh, you know, unemployment once again, rather than um, being prepared for it. And uh, no, no, I do appreciate that. And it allowed me to be decisive myself as a result of getting, you know, the correct information at the time. But, um, but I think also just, just um, going to what you were saying before uh, about, you know, people, especially, uh, I guess, you know, people in positions of power or, or supposed power, these CEOs that you mentioned and, Everything. I think quite often the, the, the dishonesty coming from, from that sort of behaviour is even just because they're afraid of confrontation. Um, it, it's, it's more that they're, um, they're just interested in themselves and they're not interested in the well-being of the people around them or um, maybe not, I don't know these people individually, but I think quite often you see this sort of behaviour and 
in, in those sorts of individuals. And uh, I think that's a big problem these days is that we see too many people who are uh, very self-serving and a modern day society encourages it. Capitalism encourages it. And, um, and I think when you put others sometimes, not all the time, we still have to look after ourselves, but putting, putting others um, before yourself or at least equally to yourself, um, I think benefits all, including ourselves when we do that. Yeah. And that's the funny thing, isn't it? When we put others first, we're actually in the long term going to benefit from that. Mm. You know, it's, that's, uh, it's the law of reciprocation. What you give yeah. out, you're going to get back sometimes tenfold, right? Um, yeah. And, you know, I think to, to add to your values, I'm just going to own, own your values for five seconds. Um, to, to add to those, I would say um, integrity, which is just doing what you said you were going to do. And mm -hmm. like you said before, we're, we're human. We don't always, we're not always able to do that. But Yeah, and, and I agree with that, Matt. Um, you know, it, it also, uh, it allows people to then trust you as well. You know, they know that if you say you're going to do something or behave in a particular way, um, that, um, that they can count on you doing that. And when you demonstrate yourself as having that sort of integrity, as you put it, um, you know, the opportunities are going to come your way. People are going to feel that they can trust you, that they can um, put you in a position of responsibility, of care, or whatever it might be, and, um, and not have to worry uh, about your uh, capacity to do what it is that you um, have uh, suggested you're intending to do. Exactly. And, and at the same time, too, I don't think, like, well, it's true, right? We're not always going to deliver positive good news. But like your dean of science and like so many other people out there, sometimes you have to deliver news that's not so uh, positive and you can't shy away from that. You know, you just have to say, Jack, you're not going to like what I'm going to say. I think you're awesome and you're, you're an asset to our company, but you're not going to have a job at that after two years. Mm -hmm. Instead of going, yeah, Jack, it'll be cool, you know, and that just being nice. And I hate that word nice because this is a good example of it. You know, people are nice instead of being honest sometimes. Yeah. Well, from that perspective, the, uh, the nicest thing that, uh, that the dean could have done for me at that time was be honest with me because that allowed me to make the right decisions for my life. And, um, and so even though maybe... The, the, the honest truth doesn't seem nice sometimes. And it's not always what people want to hear. Um, that's for certain. But, uh, but at least we can make accurate um, uh, decisions based on that information then, uh, rather than being caught out later on down the track. So, uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's not go down that road because I'll talk all day about that sort of stuff. Uh, but what I do want to know, and I guess we are starting to talk about world problems, but, but what's one or two world problems that, that you notice, that you see? I, um, I think one of the biggest issues at the moment uh, and many of the problems that we're seeing stem from this issue, and it's the issue of overpopulation worldwide. I think that's one of the biggest issues facing um, humanity, the, the world as a whole, um, not just humanity, you know, all the species that live on this planet. Are, um, are being affected by this issue. And, um, and it's what is contributing towards you know, resource depletion, habitat, habitat destruction, and um, species, loss of species diversity all throughout the world. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think that we have to be um, just honest that the world provides us with finite resources, not infinite resources, and that we are a species of animal that lives on this planet. And, uh, and we are growing beyond uh, the, uh, the population size that, that our resources can um, sustainably provide for. And, uh, and given that we understand this now with modern science and uh, just the education levels that the general person have these days and the awareness of the world that we all have, uh, I think we need to be using that information to make important decisions. And this, I think this comes down to things like um, family planning, informed family planning. You know, do we need to have 
three, four, five children necessarily in the modern world, whereas maybe just one or two to just replace ourselves rather than to add further to the population might be a, um, a more perhaps uh, um, responsible way of approaching families now that the human population is reaching the you know above seven billion uh, point so we're only going to see more issues come from it as as, uh, as we go ahead mm. okay so so awesome topic right awesome topic you know i'm going to need four more copies <laughs> to chat about it uh in australia we've got about 22 million people and in the scheme of things uh Big country, big, big land surface, but small amount of uh, people comparative to other countries, right? Yeah. Will, will we see the sort of issues that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we're already, you know, we're seeing issues to do with um, a loss of biodiversity as a result of uh, habitat fragmentation. And uh, even though we don't think, oh, it's not going to affect us individually, but as our ecosystems degrade in their health, then the entire environment that those ecosystems support, which really we have to start thinking of as a global environment now, um, is going to be affected. That um, our fisheries are being depleted and Australia is certainly reliant on, on our, our wild fisheries. The whole world is. Um, you know, th those sorts of things are just, just the tip of the iceberg. But also, I think, you know, looking at Australia as a isolated and insulated uh, nation because we're an island state uh, is not really acknowledging the fact that we're now a global society and we can't any longer think of ourselves as insulated from the issues of the rest of the world. That, uh, that what affects one part of the globe really does in some way affect us all. And uh, even if not directly at that point in time. Why, and, uh, why, why does an island country, why should we see ourselves as a global, as part of that global issue? Well, for many reasons. I mean, you can think of it from an economic perspective. What you have to do is imagine what would happen if, uh, you know, the, we saw the stock markets go all, all crazy with uh, Trump being elected recently because of uncertainty there. But what if there was a real problem that caused another stock market crash all of a sudden? Australia uh, would feel the brunt of that, as would uh, many, many, many countries across the globe. Uh, so we're connected, you know, and, um, and environmentally, issues that are degrading the quality of uh, the habitat and the earth is our habitat uh, in one area has a flow on effect, you know, all over the globe. And, um, and the more that we become aware of our need and our reliance upon the world that we live in, I think that the better our decision-making on how we move forward. And I think given humans have reached the point that we have, it's, our awareness should be taking, taking us to a point where we consider ourselves the custodians of the planet, that we're the caretakers of the planet. We're not the destroyers. We're not the, uh, the takers any longer. We, we should be... Um, uh, proactive in how we take care of our environment because if we take care of it then it takes care of us. Yeah, exactly. Okay cool so as you know my background is health, fitness, stuff like that and a big problem that's been around now since sort of the 70s and 80s is obesity and um, heart disease and stuff like that and, and given that the world you're going into is around this sort of stuff mm -hmm. do you see that continuing to be the biggest problem or will something else sort of also be a, a big big health issue uh well you're totally right it's um those uh those lifestyle non-communicable diseases are the uh, are the big issues particularly in developed countries now and um you know we've we've got uh sanitary environments so a lot of issues around um uh, cleanliness are no longer affecting the, the developed world. We've got access to fantastic medications, antibiotics and such. So communicable diseases are um, more controlled than they ever have been. But our lifestyle is what is killing us now in the developed world. And um, 
I think, though, that we're seeing the current generation who are entering their, their elderly phases of life have come through, you know, the, the period where fast food became uh, popular, became accessible, that it was easy and the health implications weren't really realized until later. And we're seeing that now. And that uh, generations such as yours and mine and then the generations below ours growing up with this higher level of awareness and education around health. Health is a, not for all of us, but I think for many of us, and I certainly you and me, um, health and fitness is at the forefront of, you know, how we approach our lives and, um, and people such as us. And I think it's a growing proportion of the population um, becoming very health orientated, at least aware, um, is really going to influence how they move into um, later adulthood. And so, thanks, Sue. Sorry, um, <laughs> I just got some mail. Um, you have to edit that one out. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't think we're going to see the same level as, of trouble as our generation hits old age, as we're seeing right now. And that's simply because of that awareness. It's not necessarily going to be any magic bullet. Maybe there might be a few medical advances that will help with the treatment of, of these problems, but ultimately they're lifestyle problems. And, um, and it's simply awareness, education, and then just being proactive enough to do something about it that yeah. will um, help prevent us from, from suffering those necessarily. 100%. Like, okay, awareness, I don't necessarily agree with knowledge. Definitely not. Why? Because we know what to do now, right? Get off your ass, stop eating shit. Everyone knows what to do. That's not the issue. But the last thing you said there around being proactive, um, and I think it's about not even having a choice, but just to do it. Because as humans, we're lazy. As humans, we like to make excuses for stuff. And we, you know, if I can have a Big Mac or I can have a salad roll, most people are going to go for the Big Mac, right? Mm. I don't know what the answer is, but something where we don't have a choice. It just has to be done. Do you know what I mean by that? I know what you mean. Although I'll just add that, um, that it's surprising once you uh, start working a little bit with people um, who are dealing with these issues. It's actually very surprising how many people, you and I are aware of it. So we think, oh, there's got to be a lot of people who are keenly aware of what they need to do and what's good for them and what's bad for them. But it's surprising how many people just aren't aware of what is yeah, good for them. Right. And, what is, and um and so I think as as a, I think awareness at this point in time is important, and, and that education around these issues is important because it will increase the number of people who are able to make, you know, the right decisions. And at the moment, a lot of people just don't know what decisions to make because they haven't been brought up with uh, with families who instilled those sorts of those ways of thinking into them. Uh, maybe they're not exposing themselves to the right media um, to you know get that sort of uh, that knowledge and that understanding. Uh, there's probably many, many, many reasons which which contribute to it, but uh, but it is definitely an issue which um, I think greater awareness, greater knowledge will make a very big difference to future generations. Exactly um, right, mate. And, and and knowing you and the journey that you're on, uh, I'm sure you'll definitely make a big dent in uh, in, in that issue. The, Can you hear me all right? There's someone grinding in the background. Yeah, yeah, that's a bit, I was just going to say there's a bit of background noise there, but yeah, I, I can hear you. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, mate, we better start wrapping this up because uh, yep. you're an important person and you've got stuff to do. My last question is where do you see yourself in 20 years? Uh, the reason I didn't say 10 years is because I know you'll be on this medical journey, but uh, knowing you, in 20 years you might be, you know, studying rocket science or... <laughs> Building solar houses like um, like the Tesla guy, but uh, where do you see yourself in twenty years, mate? Yeah, well, um, you know, they do say we're going to have uh, quite a number of different um, career paths uh, with our generation these days. I don't know what the figure they they sprout now is, but it's um, it's surprising. Um, I think I've already covered all of them, <laughs> so I'm hoping that this will be my um, my last major you know, career tangent. 
and uh, and I'm seeing myself that in 20 years I will be working proactively in the medical field. I don't know what specialization I'm going to pursue. Uh, I think I will uh, choose a specialization of some kind, though. I think that just suits how I like to delve into things with that uh, with fair detail. But um, in 20 years, I just hope that. Um, I'm satisfied with the career choice that I've made uh, at this stage of things. I, I feel I definitely will be. Um, I hope that I'm in a position where I can not just provide for myself, but provide for my partner and uh, and my family, and uh, without too much stress around around that. And uh, and uh, uh, maybe if there is any kind of obviously in 20 years. We're, start and get a little bit older by that stage um it, it could be that maybe after i've got a, a decade or two of um of knowledge in medicine under my belt i might move back into the teaching arena and start trying to uh pass that knowledge on to uh to a new doctors coming through yeah, um, nice. that could be, yeah but yeah that's my hope i hope i'm I ho i'm hoping the career that i'm setting myself up for now is uh, is the career that will last me out and yeah. by that stage, you'll be 50-something, and so will I, so I'm not really rubbing that in. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have some money, too, to finally start um, throwing around after so many years of study. I sure hope so. You know, um, uh, like I said before, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not following the money, but, um, but certainly uh, medicine takes, even just med school, you know, Typical week is 60 to 80 hours of study just to barely keep up. Um, before exams, it's over 100 hours a week. And, um, and from all I'm hearing, once we get out there working, it's, it's approximately the same uh, and, and only harder. <laughs> and, um, and so we, there's an awful lot of work that goes into it. And I do hope that the remuneration for that work and that commitment um, is, um, is reasonable. And, uh, and I hope that uh, I can... Uh, just start exploring some of the other things in life as a result of having a, um, a decent and, and reliable income. So, exactly. yeah, I'm looking mate, forward to it. Uh, let's definitely have another chat when you, uh, when you get to that point and you are experiencing all these new things. Mate, yeah, I'm absolutely. Time today. It's been awesome. Um, I've got another three or four uh, topics for our chats in, in the future. But, uh, mate, thanks for your time and uh, let's catch up again soon. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks for um, inviting me, and uh, I really appreciate it. It's good to talk to you. My pleasure, mate.